awesome. Man, there was like a... Did you hear that? Audio is up to here. Now it's just settled down. Everybody's ready to go. It's awesome. <laughs> you all are well trained. This is working well. Okay, we don't have to try to get you back in. It's good. It's good. Hey, awesome. Hey, who's excited to be here today? I am. Woo! Praise the Lord. Man, it's so good to see your faces, and we're excited for week number two of Hard Things Jesus Said. And uh, guys, we're in this series right now. We're just looking at some of these passages in Scripture where Jesus said some hard things, right? It's like, really, Jesus? That's what you mean? Like, what is he trying to say here? We're leaning into that because, guys, oftentimes we read this, we go, ah, you couldn't have meant that, or, oh, man, I'm just terrified by that. Next week is especially terrifying, and uh, especially for believers, okay? It is. It's a, it's a text that if you read it, you're like laying in bed at night going like, hmm, I hope I don't die tonight, <laughs> okay? So we're going to hit that next week, but this week I'm excited for what God's going to be doing, and in this series, church, we've been anchoring out of this Psalm 1914, it just says this, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And that, that verse, guys, is just such a uh, profound truth for somebody, isn't it? That the words of our mouth, because so often those aren't, right? They're just not. And, and yet the Lord is calling us into that. And so often, guys, the reflection of our heart, the desires that we have, the things that are coming out of our heart are anything but what we would say is acceptable to the Lord, yes? I mean, come on. We can't control our tongue, and yet we have a heart issue, right? And James says, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? That's where our words come from. It's this well that's pouring out this kind of stuff. And, and the Father's going, like, I want to deal with your heart. And so Jesus comes to the earth, and he says, I'm going to deal with the heart. Because we've been trying to do out here. We're going to deal with what's happening in here, yes? And so I'm excited for God to continue in this this morning as we lean in. Um, our prayer, again, is that we would, we would walk through this text, guys, that God would, would make our hearts reflect his heart. His heart for the nations, his heart for his people, his heart for others, um, and his heart, uh, ultimately, God, would be, he, would, he would fill us with a heart that loves him and desires him above all else. And so that's a lofty goal, yes, and uh, it's a lot of pressure on one sermon, so if y'all don't leave with that today, you know, that's on you. <laughs> but anyway, let's pray. Father, what a delight to be here, a part of your house be in your presence. God, it, there's, there's so many reasons why you should exclude us from your house, and yet you open the doors wide open, and you say, welcome in, come in, sit at my table. We're not sitting outside begging on the street corner, God, we're, we're right here in your presence. Church, let that just melt your heart this morning for the Lord, that he's the God who draws near Some of you might be in this room today and you've, you've done some things this week that you're like, I, I just can't come close to the Lord right now. The Lord's just inviting you right now. And before we get going, thank you, Lord. I pray that uh, as we lean into your voice today that you'd be the one speaking. God, we need your word. Living is active. We need your voice. We want to hear the voice of our shepherd. We want to know your voice. So silence all the other voices, God. I ask in Jesus' name, silence everything else. All the messages, the ruler of the power of the air who's working to deceive, who's working to twist and to warp your word. God, I pray you silence him in Jesus' name because we want your voice. I ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Awesome, awesome. If you guys would, grab a Bible, turn to um, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10. Um, we're going to be picking it up right in the middle of this text, um, but before we do that, I want to give you some context. Um, it's a longer chapter. We're going to be hitting through quite a bit of it today, and, uh, but some context to what's going on. Jesus has been preaching, and he's been assembling this, this group of people around him called his followers, right, who are coming to listen to what he has to say, right? And they, these are people who've just listened to the Sermon on the Mount, and they're, they're leaning into what Jesus has for them. And, uh, and then by name, he calls out 12 of them. 
and he says, you, 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 etc. right? He calls them to himself, and they come, and he says, you're going to be my disciples. I'm going to give you a mission. And so Jesus goes on giving them this mission and telling them all the things that they're going to experience as they pursue the mission of Jesus. And it's a lot of lovely things, mansions, a lot of wealth, a lot of feeling good, all this kind of stuff that he promises his guys, right? Wait, okay, no. So we're going to need to read this because that's not what he promises his guys, all right? He's going in. He's setting this whole thing up. He's giving them this mission. And you're going to hear it and you're going to go, okay, that's awesome. They're supposed to go to do this. They're supposed to go to Israel, right? They're supposed to talk to these guys. And all this is supposed to be going on and happening. Um, luckily, we're not, you know, the disciples, the 12 that were called out by name. My name's not written in here. Arlie's a unique one. We know. Um, but unfortunately, he gives them a mission, but he gives us the great commission, okay? So he levels it up and says, no, 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 they were to go to Israel, you're to go to the whole world, y'all. And that's every single one of us who's a believer. And so we want to lean into this because as he's setting this up, he's speaking into the things that we're also going to experience in our life, the things that we're going to experience as we seek to live out on his mission and to do the things that he's asking us to do. But what's amazing to me is of these 12 guys that he calls together, um, nobody would assemble this team. <laughs> nobody. <laughs> if you read a business strategy book, if you read an organizational leadership structures, if you're familiar with any kind of way of picking somebody for a team to play dodgeball, you're not going to assemble this group, okay? These guys are, are diametrically opposed to each other at the table from wherever they sit. For every person who's an A, there's a solid B over here, okay? And on and on it goes. There's guys who are pro-government, guys who want to take down the government, guys who are cheating people by the government. There's doctors, there's lawyers, there's physicians. I said that already, but I was just checking to see if you're catching it, right? There's fishermen, okay? Jesus himself is a carpenter. And there's these guys, and guys, these dudes hate each other, <laughs> Like, they culturally do not get along. They do not mix. And Jesus says, hey, come have a seat at this table together. We're going to go change the world. Come on. None of us would choose that team. But Jesus chooses that team. Praise the Lord. Yes? Man. And he goes in here. And I love it because, church, he doesn't manipulate these guys into serving. He doesn't use them. He's not abusing them. He's not promising them something that he can't deliver He's just telling them straight up how it's going to be. And this is what he says. And I want to read this with you guys. Uh, 10, verse 16. Here's what he says. <clears throat> For these guys who are going to go serve him. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Sign me up, Jesus. <laughs> Glory. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men. For they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. That's beat you. And you will be dragged, dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, when this happens to you, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, that's Satan, how much more will they malign those in his household? The word of the Lord. Amen. I feel good. Right? This is his pitch for these guys. Come and join my team where they're going to malign you, 
where they're going to flog you, where they're going to persecute you, where they're going to hate you, where they're going to drag you before governments so that they can subjugate you to the penalties of their laws. This is my team, Jesus says. Come join it. Come with me. Come and do this with me. And here's what's amazing, guys. The disciples were lightly trained, barely equipped, and sent out to speak words that they didn't even have. You notice he said, hey, he'll, he'll tell you when you need it. <laughs> right? They're not ready for this, right? They're like, they've been with him. They've been kind of following along. They've been doing their thing with Jesus. And he's going like, now I'm going to send you out and do this. This is what you're going to experience, though. And you're under-equipped. You're not ready. And you need to rely on the Father. How many of you guys just feel that in your own life? You're like, man, I, you know, you talk about Jesus' conversations. You talk about sharing your faith with somebody. Like, I don't have the right words. I don't know. What if they ask me about propitiation? I don't even know what that word means, you know, and like, what do I do here? And, and yet God is saying, but I take the people who are, are not the people others would pick. And I put them on a team that they're not ready for. And then I give them my spirit and I say, go and speak and I'll speak for you. Come on. That's who God picks. And so when we look across this room, we think, man, not everybody in here is an evangelist. Not everybody in here you know, has the gift of, of, of being able to exegete scripture and being able to teach all these things and use all these fancy theological words to convert somebody. We go, praise the Lord, because he's been using these guys since day one. Because this is who God builds his kingdom with, is the church. People who are under-equipped, not ready, who he's going to speak through when they give him his yes. Right? When they say, yes, Jesus, here I am. Send me. I'm going to go and do this. I'll be the one. Guys, because the disciples spent time at the feet of Jesus, they're passionate about the work of Jesus. See that? See, they, they didn't have all the training in the world. They didn't have all this. And then he tells them, hey, I'm going to make you sheep among wolves. Like, why would you do that? But they're passionate about the work of Jesus because they've spent time at the feet of Jesus. Yes? They know him. They know his voice. The disciples, guys, were willing to go to the end for Jesus because they understood what it was to be with Jesus. That's why they do this. They said, I'm willing to go there. I'm willing to go as a sheep among wolves. I'm willing to go get flogged, be persecuted, be hated. I'm willing to have my family turn on me for the sake of Jesus because I know what it means to be with Jesus. Sometimes, church, I think we don't know what it means to be with Jesus. We need the presence of Jesus in our life so that we will have this kind of desire to lean in and lead and follow him the way that these guys followed him because church, they weren't ready, they weren't equipped, and they weren't the A-team. And yet God uses these guys. Praise the Lord. Let's keep reading here. Verse 26. Jesus follows up that sales pitch by saying this. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus' first statement to these guys is just, it's just obvious, do not fear, Right? I mean, you hear that text, you're like, if I had to go do that, I'm fearing, yeah? There's a lot of stuff on the line for these guys. There's a lot at stake. And Jesus is saying, listen, do not fear. Do not fear. Why? Because all they can do to you is kill you. <laughs> you guys missed that? Come on. <laughs> all they can do to you is kill you. That's it. That's as far as it goes, right? They can't take anything else from you, but they can take your life. But he's going, listen, when you understand who I am, when you understand what's going on, what, who, who, you're, who you're living for, then when all they can take is your life, when you have that perspective, that they can't take anything else from you, you can press on without fear. But see, so often, so many of us are so used to spending our life worrying about our life that that's the only thing that we care about. Yeah, like, that's a lot to risk. They can take my life. And we're not willing for that. And so fear creeps in, and Jesus says, listen, 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 if you're going to follow, if you're going to serve, if you're going to come after me, if you're going to be my disciples, you've got to not fear losing your own life, because that's as much as they can take from you. But it is God who holds you in his hand, yes? 
He's the one who decides because he's the one who, guess what? He is the authority over life and in death. He is the authority over life and life everlasting. He's the one that you need to fear. So he's saying, you've got a mixed up priority. When you're afraid of these guys who can take your earthly life, you're not fearing the one who can take your eternal life. He's calling us to something bigger. He's calling us to something greater. He's leaning in and saying, do not fear because of God. And you go, man, wow. I'm going to sign up for this (laughs) at the risk of losing my life. to serve. And Jesus says this, verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? It's a great question, Jesus. Why are we talking about sparrows when you're talking about death? (laughs) And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. Why? Because you are of more value than many sparrows. How many of you guys know what a sparrow is? Yes. How many of you guys loathe the sparrow? Anybody in this room today? You have a situation? Yeah, okay. Yeah, any, any amens out there? Come on. You can be honest here. It's church. Sparrows are these little brown and gray birds that live everywhere, literally, right? You go to any continent, they're there, they're always around, they're into things. In fact, the sparrow, I don't know if you guys knew this, but the sparrow um, is the only bird that we know of that actually needs human life to live. Did you know that? That it can only live up to 400 meters away from society, And when towns move on, when a culture moves on, a ghost town happens, the the population of sparrows there actually goes extinct. Did you guys know that? Their life is sustained through your life being sustained. Did you know that? And God is saying here with the sparrow, he goes, listen, this is an invasive species, right? It follows humankind all over the place. We have um, a sparrow that likes to live in our chimney, at my house in the summertime, it comes in and builds a nest, and, uh, and every so often it falls down the chimney through the flue and comes flying into our living room. That's a nice day, isn't it? <laughs> my wife will say. And, uh, and so then we are running like madmen through our house trying to catch this diseased little bird to get it out of there before it touches everything in our kitchen, right? Come on. It's a nuisance, right? Everywhere they go, they're making messes, they're doing things, and yet God says, but I care, and not one of them falls to the ground in death without me approving it and knowing it. I hold their life in the palm of my hand as well. That's what God is saying. He said, listen, but the sparrows, I care for the sparrows. He says, your hair on your head. How many of y'all know how much hair you have on your head? Nobody in here got a good guess? Yeah. <laughs> He's down to like one. <laughs> so I had to look this up because I'm like, how, many, how much hair do we have on our head? Anybody got a guess? Just shout it out. Guesses. Sager. It's a lot. If you're blonde, you have more. If you're dark-haired, you have less, right? The average person has 100,000 pieces of hair. Did you know that? 100,000. You don't. You do not. (laughs) But average, 100,000 pieces of hair, strands. Now, do you know how much you lose a day? Some of y'all lose a lot, (laughs) Take it up with my wife, man. Uh, you lose 50 to 100 strands of hair a day. So your hair is ever-changing, right? And the only person who cares about the hair on top of your head is you, <laughs> right? Come on. Y'all walk and look around going like, oh, man, he doesn't have enough hair. Oh, he's got too much. His hair's too tall, right? The only one who really cares, it's inconsequential, right? How many hairs do you have on your head? Who cares? You have hair on your head or you don't. You're good. But you care about it. God cares about it. He cares about that detail. The most insignificant bird and the most inconsequential number of hair you have on your head, God cares for it. And Jesus said, if God cares for that, don't you think he cares for you? Because see, you're more valuable than many sparrows. And I care about all of them. How much more do I care about you? See, sometimes, church, we hear messages like this where we're supposed to go be a disciple. We've got this call to be a disciple. And we think, man, I'm just kind of a cog in the wheel of the kingdom of God, right? 
Like, God saved me, so I'll go do this thing and just kind of produce his thing and keep his stuff going, right? You're not a cog in the wheel. God's not using you. He cares for you. And he calls you to mission so that he can transform you. God is calling you into his mission for you because he cares for you. See, so often, church, we don't, we don't recognize the depth of God's love for us, his care for us, his devotion to us as his people. And we think, you're gonna send me out as a sheep among wolves. <laughs> Come on, church. He's sending you out as one of his in that space. And he cares for you. Some of y'all need to hear that today, and that's where we should stop. <laughs> you need to be reminded of that today. Because maybe other people aren't caring for you really well. Maybe you haven't experienced that before. Maybe you don't think that. Maybe you think God is just putting up with you. I want to tell you today, God cares for you so much. He loves you so much. And I think, church, the disciples knew this, and that's why they said yes. Because I'm not signing up for a guy telling me to do that stuff without knowing that he has absolutely everything good for me. Yes? He loves me. Verse 32. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Come on. But everyone who denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Guys, Jesus is making an argument here. He's saying, listen, I want you to go out and speak my, my gospel. I want you to tell people about the kingdom of heaven. I want you to, to tell them what's going on here. And, and your life is going to be lived in such a way that it's going to acknowledge me before men, right? The way you're living your life speaks to who Jesus is. Yes, he's saying, that's how you're acknowledging me. By your obedience, by your love, by your devotion, by the life that you live outside of these doors, okay? He's going, you're acknowledging my presence, you're acknowledging who I am. And he says, for those of you who acknowledge me, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. Hallelujah. That's a good thing, yes? But see, when we live our lives in fear, when we live our lives in rejection of that, when we say, I'm not gonna yield to that, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna follow, I'm not gonna show people because I'm afraid of them, then God goes, you're actually denying Jesus in your life. Do you know that? You're denying the reality that you have a savior that you've been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. And God says, if you're denying that, then so will you be denied. It's a big deal. He's saying, this is the God who cares for you, who loves you. He's the one who holds your soul. And he's telling you, listen, here, the evidence of that in your life is your action in his mission. And he's going, do not lean out of that. He's making an argument here, church. He's saying, because the Father cares for you and you have no reason to fear, then tell people about Jesus. Because the Father loves you and you have no reason to fear, then tell people about Jesus. Guys, you're not a cog in the wheel in the mission of God. God is not using you. He's positioning you and he's transforming you, guys. And you can't deny him before the Father. That is what fear leads us to do, is deny. Your life speaks Life speaks. And fear sometimes, guys, is the loudest voice that we hear. Diedrich Bonhoeffer wrote this sentence from a prison cell in a Nazi concentration camp just weeks before he was killed. He said this, those who are still afraid of men have no fear of God. And those who have fear of God have ceased to be afraid of men. That's the reality. Do not fear those who can only kill your body, but fear the one who can put your body and your soul in hell, right? Who can kill both. He's saying fear of God drives out the fear of others. That's what he's getting after here, church. But so often we're afraid of all the voices. We're afraid of all the image. We're afraid of the things that are coming against us. And we live into that reality. We let the voice of fear drive everything that we're doing. And therefore our life then lives in denial of the one we're supposed to be proclaiming. It's a big deal. 
And guys, the thing is, is that it's not often for us that we're facing fear in the, in the Western church from persecution or from others around us or that kind of thing. I don't walk to my house and think, hey, if I live my life openly as a Christian, I'm going to face consequences. Anybody in here feel like you're going to... We, we don't have that. We don't have to fear that. These guys had to fear that. So, so often, the fear doesn't come to us in the form of that. It comes to us in the form of familiar faces. I want to go on with this text. It says this. Verse 34. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. This said from the Prince of Peace, everybody. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but what? But a sword. Listen to this. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother. That's what I've come to do. And a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own, what? Household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is the cost of discipleship. Jesus says, I I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I'm coming to bring a sword. Guys, that's not an easy thing for him to say, yes? We're like, come on. What is he saying with that? Daniel Doriani says this, the sword represents choice, not judgment. Choice, not judgment. Decision leads to division, even in families, as one chooses Christ while another chooses darkness. That's the reality. And for this first century Jewish community, choosing to be obedient to Jesus oftentimes meant walking away from their family. It meant I'm choosing to divide. See that? I'm choosing to move away from because I'm following Jesus. I'm severing the tie here with my family because I'm choosing Christ and they're hating me because of that. I'm being persecuted because of that. They're rejecting me because I am choosing to follow Jesus, guys. And Jesus says, that's what I came to do because I'm cutting away people who are gonna follow me. And I don't know about you guys, but listen, you recognize we're in a spiritual battle. I don't want to be following the guy into the wolves who doesn't have a weapon with him, yes? I want the guy with a sword in his hand. See, so often we think, you know, this, this little image of Christ, but he's the one, he's the warrior king, right? He's coming back, he's going to rule, and he's going to reign, and he says, I'm bringing a sword, and I'm going to sever the things that are going to hold your heart back from following me. I'm going to cut off those things that are going to keep you from following me, keep you from everything that Christ has for you. And so, guys, listen, you've got to love Christ more than your family. That's hard. I mean, that just, doesn't it just stick against everything you think? Loving Christ more than your family, like choosing him over and at the expense of your family. For us, it's, it's not as big of a deal. Right? We've got Muslim brothers and sisters overseas and, and even here who, when they choose Christ, they're choosing to sever away from their family, to be hated. It's not often that we have to face that, but guys, I know people in our church right now, today, sitting here in this room, whose children have rejected them because they are following Jesus and they're telling about Jesus. Kids have. Jesus yet has a high view of family. He talks about it multiple times. But he's saying, if you're going to love me, if you're going to come after me, you've got to be willing to sever with that. You've got to be willing to give me your all. I'm going to be first in your life. He says, in fact, even over your life, right? Whoever does not take up his cross. As we have a, a romanticized view of the cross, yeah? We wear it around our neck put it in our car to keep us from getting in a car crash, things like that, right? And we're like, yeah, the cross, it's empty. It means victory, right? It means triumph. It's my hope. It's my future. We sing songs about it. It's glorious. It's a powerful truth. Remember, Jesus said this before he went to the cross. He said, take up your cross before he went there, before there was victory. And what does a cross mean, guys? It means suffering, sin, shame, death, agony, To put up is less than human even. It's demoralizing, shameful. And Jesus says, take that on. You're going to follow me. That's what you're going to take on. 
Think about that, church. To follow Jesus, you're saying no to this comfort and the, and the things that we always want to desire and go after. He says, you got to deny that if you're going to pursue me because guess what, guys? People who, who want to live for that aren't going to go into the wolf den. You're not going to come after Jesus if you want that in your life. You're not going to step up in that moment to lean into him, guys. Listen, Jesus' promise in his gospel is that you will suffer for the sake of his name. That's his promise, that you will suffer. And that just smacks right in the face of our desires, doesn't it? Of the things that we want in our heart, the things that we're longing for, the things that we're leaning into, guys. Like, listen, some of us, you were coerced onto Jesus' team by a false gospel that said you're going to find purpose, hope, healing, love, joy. Everything's good is going to happen to you. You're going to have healing and wealth, and, and everything's going to go great in your life, and you're going to be blessed. Anybody in here, you heard that message? Of a grandpa who's a preacher, and used to tell me, Arlie, as a little case, said, Arlie, being a Christian's not for weenies. <laughs> weenies don't sign up for that. You're not doing it. You're like, I'm not going to go lay my life down for this guy. Like, I'm not going to do that, right? If I'm living in fear, if I'm living in, in, the, in the torment of all that that is, I'm not going to do it. And yet so often, guys, what we want, we want a gospel of prosperity when Jesus promises us a gospel of perseverance. He says, the one who continues to the end will be saved. Yes, Jesus is not promising you prosperity. He's not selling you a bill of goods. If you've been sold a bill of goods in the church, you have not been given the gospel. You have been given a false truth. You've been given a false reality that leads us into absolute bankruptcy when our life falls out and we realize we're suddenly suffering with Christ. Yes? Was it supposed to be this way? Jesus says, yes, it was. Because I'm conforming you to my image in that suffering. But Jesus doesn't leave it there, guys. He goes on, verse 40. Whoever receives you, receives me. Don't miss that line right there, guys. Whoever receives you, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. See, Jesus is saying, listen, you've got to look to the future. You've got to look to beyond what you're going through right now in this life. You've got to look to beyond what's happening, guys. We just sang a song that said, I, want to, I live to hear these words, well done, good and faithful. You gotta look to that, to that day, to the reward that is promised. He's saying, listen, if you're living for right now, you're gonna fear, man. That's all you have is to fear. If you're living in this world for this thing, for everything around you, for the comforts in your life, for everything you're trying to keep together on your own power, he's saying you're gonna constantly be sucked into living for that and you're not living for the day that I make all things right because that promise is coming. No more sin, suffering, sickness, or death. That is coming, church. Amen. It says, if you've suffered with Christ, so you will also be glorified with Christ. Come on. But Jesus says right here, I love this, guys. Listen to these words. He says, whoever receives you receives me. Guys, so often we live like heaven is the goal. Heaven's not the goal. Jesus is the goal. Come on. Jesus is the goal. Jesus is the prize. Knowing him, living with him, being with him in fullness, that's the prize. That's our aim. That's what we're seeking. Heaven's a bonus, Right? But Jesus is the goal, and he's offering us into that right now. He's saying, right now, church, let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father. We need a larger vision. lay our hearts down. At the cross. Lord, I pray that just in this room, 
there was a willingness with your disciples to say yes to you and no to everything else, God, that there'd be a willingness in our hearts. Lord, it's so easy for us to get caught up in the things that we have and the relationships that we have and the things and the fear that we miss you. as I pray right now that you just help us see the value of you. And the purity of your love towards us, God. Help us to fear you. Help us to live our lives in that name, God. We're seeking you. Church, just have a moment with the Lord. If he's resting on your heart with something from this today, just, just let him keep doing that with him. We're gonna sing a song together. The band's gonna come up. We're gonna sing a song and, and just leave today in worship. Singing a song that's familiar to most of you guys is called In Christ Alone. Because it says, in Christ alone, my hope is found. So often we're, we're putting our hope in other things. We're placing it on other, other people. And yet Jesus says, no, 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 I am your hope. I am the prize. I am the reward. And so our prayer today, God, is, is that as your people, that our hope would truly be found in Christ alone because there's no other there's nothing else, God. There's no family member. There's no relationship. There's no blessing in life that's greater than you, Jesus. I pray that we have that perspective. God, if our hearts need to be woken up to that today, I pray you wake our hearts up to that. Jesus, we need you. We want to be more like you. Let's lean into that for a moment, church, and we'll sing.